Once again, I want to begin with my great gratitude to the members of Calvary Church, to Chris, to Eileen, to those who make this Lenten preaching series possible. In case, and I was just having a conversation with, at this, in case Calvary folks are not aware, the entire city is aware of this preaching series, looks to see who you've invited every year, pays attention, and knows what a gift this is. So blessings on you for having given this to the rest of us. For your invitation to me, I'm especially grateful. I'm delighted to share part of my Lenten journey with all of you. Thank you. Today, my attention turns to a story in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. As we are moving closer to Holy Week, so is John's story as we come to John 10. In less than two chapters, John will give us his account of Palm Sunday, and then the events of Holy Week will begin unfolding. But we're not quite there yet. In both gospel and calendar, we are on the cusp of Holy Week. Perhaps we can sense it. And John has words to help us prepare. In the story that has grabbed me for this day, Jesus is back in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. It was winter, John says in 1022, which for this gospel is always more than a weather report. Winter tells of nights that are long and unwelcoming, daylight that's often too brief and too gray, air that is cold and biting. And Jesus is back in the territory of those who oppose him. Some of you will remember that in the land of Narnia, in C.S. Lewis' classic children's stories, the presence of evil meant perpetual winter. So yes, it was winter in John 10, in more ways than on the calendar. By the way, the weather today is like, what? This is a... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Jerusalem, as Jesus entered it that winter, was an occupied city. It contained a palace for the ranking Roman official, you may have heard of him, Pontius Pilate. It housed a segment of the Roman army in the fortress of Antonia, which was built adjacent to the temple. And the temple itself buzzed with activity that was the result of Roman rule. Roman taxes were collected and gathered there. Sacrifices were offered on behalf of the emperor. And the chief priests got to be chief priests by bribing their way into Roman favor. People in the first century knew nothing about separation of church and state. For them, religion, politics, and economics were inextricably intertwined. So the temple complex was the White House, the IRS building, and the National Cathedral all at the same time. And Rome directed its political policies, its tax code, and its liturgy. Now, you shouldn't imagine, despite all of that, you shouldn't imagine that those bribing, conniving chief priests walked around the temple looking like evil characters in some story. In the movies, we always know who the bad guys are. Their dress is sinister and the music is foreboding. In real life, there's no music. And the scruffy look that used to be sinister is now considered rather cool. <laughs> The same was likely true in first century Jerusalem. There was no music. And the chief priests and their allies looked like ordinary human beings, not demons. They had chosen to cooperate with Rome and probably considered themselves pragmatists for doing so. Rome had a really big, really powerful army. And Israel was a tiny little country. Their thinking was likely this, if we're going to survive, we've got to learn to go along to get along. It's Rome's dance. So we'd better learn Roman steps if we don't want to get run over on the dance floor. And frankly, it's an understandable response to the reality they faced. I mean, who among us can be sure we wouldn't have done the same thing were we in their shoes? But what does dancing Roman steps in a Roman dance 
on a Roman dance floor do to you after a while? At what point do you look and act more Roman than who you really are? At what point are you only thinking about the next step in a dance that Rome is directing? At what point does the Roman dance become the only dance you know how to do? So as Jesus entered Jerusalem at that time, the Roman dance likely felt to many Jews like the only dance in town. And it was winter. Yes, it was. Now, if you'll bear with my dance metaphor just a little longer, I'll describe Jesus' response to the reality he and his countrymen and women faced this way. He heard different music. He danced different steps. And he thought the Roman dance floor was ugly. That's how we say that in the South, right? It was ugly. And those who had invested themselves in dancing with Rome did not appreciate his differences. Not at all. John 10, 22 and following. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Judeans gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, to our ears, the questioning by Jesus' opponents might sound almost silly. We've made Messiah into a theological title for Jesus and equated it with him being the divine son of God. So of course he was the Messiah. And he'd been doing and saying Messiah-like things all along. The questioners are clearly blind and deaf and laughable. But first century ears would have heard the question quite differently. In this world, prior to 2,000 years of church theologizing, Jesus' titles, Jesus' title of Messiah, or their use of Messiah, I really should say right here, was a potentially exciting, potentially dangerous term. We should spell it with a lowercase m, and understand it as someone who has been given a special task by God. And the task for which many Jews hoped that God would anoint a Messiah was removing the Romans from the Promised Land. So the term was politically loaded in that winter, which means their question was politically loaded. If Jesus accepted the term Messiah, well, the Romans would have to deal with him. But if he refused it, many in the crowd would likely turn away in disappointment. Well, Jesus is many things. He is not a dummy. <laughs> He's already refused to dance their dance. And now he refuses to play their word game. I told you, he said, and you don't believe me. If they had wanted to have a real conversation with him about the task God had given him to do, or even if God had given him a task, they'd had ample opportunity, but they hadn't done so. The reality is they weren't interested in a real conversation, and this wasn't a real question. It was a setup. And Jesus still wasn't dancing their dance. But he does have something else to say to them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that God is in me and I am in God. Many of us have parents or teachers or coaches or all of the above who told us that actions speak louder than words. Well, this is something that our culture apparently has in common with Jesus' world because he's counting on his audience understanding that idea. Jesus' opponents aren't interested in a real conversation with him about a task God may have given him to do. Okay, fine. Then look at what I'm doing, he says to them and to anyone else who's listening. If I'm not doing the works of God, then don't believe me. 
But if I am, if I am doing the works of God, then believe that God is in me and I am in God. He might have elaborated on his assertion in this way. We say that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. So have I been thus with those in need of grace and mercy? Like a lonely woman at a well in Samaria, or a man blind from birth, or even a leader from your own ranks who came to me at night wanting to know if rebirth was possible for him. We say that the steadfast love of the Lord never fails. Have I been steadfast in my loving? Have I loved a woman caught in adultery and the room keepers of the world as much as I love Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Did I offer healing to an official son and also to a blind beggar? Have I loved my disciples to the end, even when they act like charter members of the knucklehead club? We say that God heard the cries of the slaves down in Egypt and brought them out of slavery with a mighty hand. Have I heard the cries of those virtually enslaved by Rome and responded by healing them and feeding them and showing them how to live as God's beloved ones? Have I shown them how to resist Rome's oppression and not allow Rome to rob the life that God has given to them? Have I shown them how to dance with God? We say that God has shown us what is good, that what God calls us to is to love justice, to do mercy, to walk humbly with our God. So did I receive the Samaritans as beloved children of God, not as people who are less than us? Did I feed thousands of hungry people but refuse their cries to become their king? So look at what I'm doing. If I'm doing the works of God, then believe that God is in me and I am in God. Friends, it seems to me that it takes a lot of courage to say, look at what I'm doing. I am thinking it takes a lot of courage to ask for scrutiny, to be radically transparent, to invite others to examine what we say and what we do to see if those things fit together seamlessly. But that's what Jesus does. Look at what I'm doing, he cried. I would guess that there were multiple reasons that the people who encountered Jesus that winter found him to be a compelling person, someone to hear and wonder about and be drawn to. And I'd also guess that one of those reasons was his integrity. He claimed to abide in God. He said he loved God. And he declared that God was at work renewing the world, that God had a new and joyous dance for them to dance. And he believed so surely that the way he lived would support what he proclaimed, that he invited people, including his opponents, to examine what he did. Which, by the way, made it impossible for those opponents to ignore him. Rome and its allies in Jerusalem could not just allow him to go on saying and acting as if God had choreographed a new dance for God's people. Jesus' words and his actions together made too compelling a case for God's renewal, so they had to stop him. And so we have the painful events of Holy Week just ahead of us. But we who are gathered here are not his opponents. We claim to be Jesus' disciples. And it may be that the challenge we face is more daunting than that of his opponents. For we are called to follow Jesus. And this story demands that we be able to follow him in saying, look at what I'm doing. If I am doing the works of God, then believe that God is in me and I am in God. 
Not just what I say, I believe. Not just the creeds I recite. Not just the confessions I make. But also whether or not my living bears witness to the beliefs I claim to hold dear. We are called to follow Jesus in being able to say, look at what I'm doing. I'm going to guess that I don't need to tell you that the most common criticism made against the church is that we are a bunch of hypocrites. We say one thing and then we dance to a different tune. I also likely don't need to tell you that hypocrisy is not holy. And Holy Week now beckons. But perhaps you need to hear that a say one thing but do another way of responding to God may be why some of us sense that something is lacking in our spiritual lives. For that response indicates a sort of faithful, half-hearted following of Jesus. One of the great lines in contemporary American poetry is relevant here as Mary Oliver asks us, listen, are you breathing just a little and calling it a life? Half-hearted following is like breathing just a little. And yes, it indicates that something is lacking. So friends, the end of Lent, the beginning of Holy Week, it is time to breathe deeply, to breathe fully. May we have the courage to scrutinize ourselves, to examine what we say and what we do to see if they flow together seamlessly and make a compelling case for God's renewal in our own lives. Let us hear anew the music of God which Jesus hears and dance God's dance of joy which Jesus danced even as Rome turns its violence against him and the pragmatists call him a fool. As Holy Week beckons, may we find ourselves dancing like no one is looking and following Jesus wholeheartedly. And may we follow him all the way to Calvary and beyond to the jubilant hope of Easter morning. Friends, a blessed Holy Week to us all. Amen.